Hello everyone and thank you for attending today's webinar on patient centricity and the evolving role of microsampling. I'm Naima Mondral, Senior Editor of Bioanalysis Zone, and I'll be your host for today's event. Before I introduce you to our speaker, I'd like to quickly cover a few housekeeping items. Firstly, all the widgets are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. You can expand your slide area or maximise it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right-hand corner. You can find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen. And an on-demand version of today's webinar will be available approximately one hour after the webinar and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Today, we are delighted to have Jeff Pomley, Scientific Director of Method Development at Alter Sciences, presenting for us. Jeff began his research career in the gas phase iron chemistry laboratory of Professor Raymond E. March as a research scientist designing novel iron trap scan functions to support applications development. He then joined Thermo Instruments Canada as an applications marketing chemist, then SciEx as a senior scientist in product definition and core research. Jeff's current research interests include applications development involving iron mobility spectrometry and the implications of microsampling technology into patient-centric medical devices. Thank you for joining us today, Jeff, and I look forward to your presentation. We invite the audience to submit any questions you may have for our presenter throughout the webinar using the Q&A widget to the right-hand side of your screen. We will pose your questions to Jeff in our live Q&A session after the presentation and then follow up any outstanding questions offline. Thank you again for joining us today, everyone, and I'll now hand over to Jeff to start today's presentation. Well, thank you to all attendees for dialing in today and to the Bioanalysis Zone for the kind introduction to today's talk, which considers the evolving role of microsampling uh, in support of the global movement towards a more patient-centric approach to healthcare. So we'll start off looking at the primary drivers responsible for the massive resurgence in dried blood microsampling over the past five years, and then auger in on one of the more successful approaches to microsampling as represented by Mitra Vam's technology, and therein consider the bioanalytical workflows necessary for accurate and precise reporting of drug concentration, which I'll illustrate with a few case studies for both small and large molecule. We'll then take a look at integrated device technology, which has been engineered specifically for ease of patient use. Uh, and I'll report some results from a pilot study using the TASO on-demand blood microsampling device applied to deriving PK profiles from both uh, in-clinic and at-home sample collection. Finally, we'll conclude by considering those assessments necessary for method development and both the clinical and bioanalytical validations necessary to ensure a successful microsampling program, including data illustrating the statistical approach one needs to consider in order to determine the correlation between dried blood microsampling and traditional wet matrices uh, such as plasma or serum. I'm going to start off with a couple of rudimentary definitions for those new to microsampling, starting with the definition of microsampling itself, which is often referred uh, to as the collection of small volumes of biological matrices for the accurate determination of circulating concentrations of uh, therapeutic drugs, metabolites, and biomarkers uh, in both preclinical and clinical studies. Now, we'll often see less than 50 microliters as the cutoff for microsampling, but in the past five years, we've not analyzed microsamples uh, beyond 20 microliters. And in fact, the norm nowadays is, is 10 microliters or below. The other critical definition for this presentation is the blood hematocrit, which is the volume fraction of red blood cells in whole blood expressed as a percentage. And I've indicated the range of hematocrit values considered healthy for each gender and for the human population at large. The most common way to determine blood hematocrit is by centrifugation to separate the plasma fraction from the red blood cell fraction. Uh, and as I've illustrated in this slide, uh, for this particular donor, uh, the blood hematocrit would have been reported at uh, about 41%. And we'll see shortly just how critical blood hematocrit is and the impact it can have on the accuracy of reported drug concentration. So 
So why are we seeing such a profound resurgence in microsampling over the past five years or so? Well, there are three primary reasons, the first of which is that microsampling fulfills a primary initiative of patient-centric healthcare, which is giving patients the capacity to actively participate in their own treatment experiences. And I'll just quote the Institute of Medicine's definition for the patient-centric healthcare approach as, quote, providing care that is respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs and values, ensuring that patient values guide all clinical decisions, end quote. And so, it's pretty obvious that adherence to this definition is facilitated in part by implementation of microsampling procedures that allow patients to self-collect microliter volumes of capillary blood using minimally invasive techniques, such as traditional finger stick, or more recently through the application of integrated devices uh, containing both lancet and collection substrate. Either approach, I think we'd all agree, is far more patient-centric than venipuncture for milliliter blood draws. And so for microsampling to play a role in the patient-centric approach, key objectives include supporting at-home or remote sample collection, which means a shift from wet samples to dry blood microsamples, which inherently results in low-volume collection, thereby reducing patient burden. From a clinical trial point of view, in accomplishing these objectives, we also create new opportunities to enrich our data uh, through taking the trial to the patient. So in the next slide, let's take a look at some of the clinical drivers for microsampling. So in giving patients the ability to take samples anytime and anywhere, there's an entire host of new opportunities for acquiring exposure data, such as allowing monitoring to ensure compliance with the clinical protocol, for example, inclusion exclusion criteria for co-meds, it also gives us improved access to vulnerable and critically ill populations that might struggle with ambulation, and it gives us opportunity for episodic sampling in order to relate efficacy with bioavailability. We can also enrich our trials by sampling for additional assessments, such as measuring for critical biomarkers, or to optimize an individualized drug dosage through therapeutic drug monitoring. Most promising is also the alignment of low volume sampling for studies in children and neonates, which we've had our fair share of here at, at Alta Sciences. Uh, and finally, the less invasive nature of microsampling itself has the potential to accelerate recruitment efforts, reduce dropout rates, and increase subject engagement. So the second reason we're seeing a resurgence in microsampling is due to improvements in analytical sensitivity and specificity, which accommodates both reduced sample volume and the increased complexity of blood as a matrix when compared to plasma. Having low sample volume without an ability to concentrate extracts requires highly sensitive mass spec systems paired with LC front ends that together optimize signal to noise ratio. To give an example relevant to this talk, as we will be looking at anti-epileptic drugs later on as a case study, this table compiles the signal-to-noise ratio gain for 16 uh, anti-epileptic drugs, comparing two generations of Cyx triple quads, uh, the Cyx 5500 introduced in 2008, and the 6500 plus brought to market in 2016. The average signal-to-noise gains from this panel of AEDs is, is about 8 to 1, and independent of the polarity mode. Now, just as I was putting this finishing, the finishing touches on this presentation, actually, Cyx announced the new 7500 triple quad on July 9th, and that looks to offer an additional three to five fold improvement in signal to noise ratio. And so uh, this next generation platform is very exciting for the, for the microsampling world. Two solutions we've used to overcome selectivity challenges in our laboratory include either accurate mass filtering or the use of differential mobility spectrometry to separate analyte from interference uh, based on physical cross-section prior to mass selection. And so this slide really demonstrates an ability to reduce the achievable LOQ for the light chain of rituximab uh, over five-fold compared to traditional MRM on a 6500 plus. And we do that by eliminating in interferences either through the measurement of the exact mass of the progeny ion on a triple top 6600 or by differentiation of ion mobilities using the select ion device, each approach being quantifiable within large molecule acceptance criteria.
In terms of the bioanalytical drivers for dried blood microsampling, there were only a few. As on the analysis side of things, there are mainly challenges. But the drivers do include the potential for improved stability for labile analytes, for example, prodrugs, and the elimination of the complexities that are associated with cold chain shipping, storage, and processing. Uh, and there are cost savings as well to be considered, uh, some $40,000 on a 1,500 sample uh, multi-center trial, according to the Neoteryx uh, uh, trial cost calculator uh, for their METRA sampling device, which you can find at their website. So the third reason we're seeing a resurgence in microsampling is due to recent advancements in collection technology for dried blood, such as those from Trajan, Neoteryx, and Tasso, which I'll describe in turn over the next few slides. But suffice it to say here that they all offer a volumetric approach to sampling, and to appreciate what that means, we need to revisit traditional dried blood, dried blood spot microsampling. So classical dried blood microsampling, so in classical dried blood microsampling, pardon me, one would collect blood onto a cellulose substrate card, store the cards in a sealed envelope containing desiccant, and then ship that off to the testing laboratory where an analyst would then take a sub-punch of the dried spot. One of the main issues with conventional DBS is that it suffers from a hematocrit effect when analyzing the sub-punch. And the reason for this is that the increased viscosity of the blood with increasing hematocrit level results in smaller blood spots such that a greater proportion of sample is taken. So one tends to observe a negative concentration bias at low hematocrit and a positive concentration bias at high hematocrit when compared against median hematocrit levels. And so obviously this represents an analytical shortcoming uh, when using this technique for microsampling. In 2015, a company called Neoterix addressed, uh, with the introduction of their Mitra Vans technology, which was based on centered thermoplastic beads, uh, a solution to traditional DBS through volumetric blood collection, which was independent of hematocrit level. Um, in their product, the substrate is anchored to a plastic handler, which makes it easy to orient the tip with the surface of a, a finger stick blood. Sampling completion is quick and self-indicating, and the collected blood is dried in approximately two hours at room temperature in the presence of desiccant. Uh, substrates uh, for the Neoteric are available in 10, 20, or 30 microliter collection volumes. Another volumetric approach to blood collection from a finger stick is that offered by uh, Trajan, uh, Trajan's Hemapen, which uh, actually on July 2nd of this year received FDA approval as a class one device for therapeutic and in vitro diagnostic use. The device collects the blood via four integrated uh, 2.74 microliter microcapillaries, each depositing the blood on a pre-cut paper disc uh, used in traditional DBS. Uh, and that happens when the cap is replaced following the sampling. I've listed here a recent publication from the Stove Lab, which details the performance attributes of the HEMA pen, which I've, I've, I've got here in this slide. Uh, in our own experience with the device, it was a very straightforward um, technique to implement with the advantage of offering quadruplicate sampling for biobanking purposes, uh, whilst eliminating the risk of tampering, thereby maintaining sample integrity. Along with the manifold that holds the four pre-cut discs, desiccant is also stored in the barrel of the pen, uh, which ensures a dry environment. Our last device for consideration is that from Tasso, which they've called the on-demand. It's a sterile, single-use only integrated capillary blood collection device includes, which includes a lancet assembly and a detachable reservoir for the collection of whole blood uh, in one instance on centered thermoplastic beads uh, to give a dry blood sample. Alternatively, about 300 microliters of wet blood may be sampled into the appropriate collection pod in roughly three minutes if it's a wet blood assay that you're after. So the way it works is the device is held in place on an appropriate sampling site of the body using mild adhesive, uh, usually the upper arm, and a lancet is actuated by pressing the big red button puncturing the skin about 2.5 millimeters. When the buttons released, the lancet retracts, and there's a small vacuum that is created, and in the case of collection onto thermal plastic beads, the blood that pools on the surface of the skin is transported using microfluidic channels, 
where it's sequentially absorbed by capillary action onto each substrate. As you can see in this illustration here, there's a sponge at the end of the device that collects excess blood. And once the sample is collected, a cellophane adhesive is removed uh, from the sample pod and the entire device is sealed in foil containing desiccant. At Alta Sciences, the most commonly supported microsampling technology to date has been that of the Mitra Vamsa device. Uh, and I believe it's because of its non-intimidating nature for implementation and that collection is self-indicating. So in 2016, we had our first Mitra Vams program. And since then, we've developed and validated over 15 methods with over a quarter million samples analyzed. We very early on concluded through gravimetric analysis, which I've summarized in the table on the left, that both accurate and precise sampling volumes were achievable without hematocrit bias. In terms of whether Mitra Vans represents the ideal sampling technique, I think this survey recently published in bioanalysis regarding the microsampling approach used in each stage of drug development nicely reveals the ra rather rapid adoption of the technology, particularly in discovery, non-GLP preclinical, and phase one through to phase four studies. So those are the benefits we and our clients see for the Mitra device. And of course, like any new technology, there are always associated challenges. Uh, logistically, real estate for a large number of microsamples can be problematic. We've overcome that challenge at Alta Sciences with a dedicated temperature and humidity controlled storage room with custom designed shelving and drawers and a state of the art logging and retrieval system. Bioanalytically, there have been some published reports of blood hematocrit impacting drug recovery when just using vortex mixing as an e extraction technique, as noted by Mano et al. from the ESI lab. And this could be, com be, could be overcome, but not completely eliminated using a more aggressive sonication approach. Another potential issue has been reported from the Merck lab, where they observed reduced recovery of analyte as a function of microsample age uh, when using a direct extraction approach involving vortex mixing. But when they went to a more aggressive approach involving pre-soaking, sonication, and methanol, uh, followed by a liquid-liquid extraction, this age-related extractability was overcome. Now, it's important to note that in dried blood assays, recovery bias cannot be compensated for by use of an internal standard. And of course, this adds to the bioanalytical challenge and begs for the development of an extraction approach capable of overcoming routinely uh, hematocrit-induced recovery bias and or age-related extractability. As one of the prevailing theories for reduced recovery and age-related extractability is entrapment of analyte in the pores of the mitra with increasing urethrocyte concentration, we consider sample preparation approaches more aggressive than vortex mixing and sonication. Uh, previous work we'd done on naproxen uh, and pre-cut DBS demonstrated reduced recovery with increasing hematocrit that we could overcome by homogenization of the entire cellulose substrate. So we hypothesized that a similar approach could be implemented with the Mitra substrate through bead beading uh, to equalize our naproxen recovery across all hematocrit levels by shearing off the outer dried blood layers, layers uh, with desorption of analyte upon Mitra compression and subsequent absorption upon reformation. The analogy would be something like the peeling off of layers of an onion and then soaking and wringing um, of a sponge coinciding to absorption and desorption of the extraction solvent. As our early characterization uh, revealed that the Mitra substrate remains intact during bead beading, we coined the approach impact-assisted extraction. Let's take a look at how that works. We use naproxen as our standard laboratory probe since we've had a, a very long history with this molecule from previous studies, uh, previous microsampling studies. And so we're certain that it had very good systemic exposure uh, in order to characterize later on the TASO on-demand device. So here's how impact-assisted extraction works. As illustrated on the left, into a 96 well plate, we first place the meter tip, followed by a stainless steel bead, and then we add extraction solvent containing stable label internal standard. We perform bead beading of the Mitra using a Spex Geno grinder, and after exhaustive titration over a multitude of projects, we found that 1750 strokes per minute for 10 minutes is optimal in about 95% of cases. Now, what we've observed during impact assisted extraction is that the Mitra tip remains intact. We do observe insoluble urethrocyte debris, 
uh, at the bottom of the well plate, so we know we're removing some of those surface layers. There's no positional exchange between the meter and the stainless steel bead, which is important to ensure compression against the bottom of the well plate, and there's no free rotation of the meter. So we're certain the majority of surfaces undergo impact. Uh, and finally, we do note that the process can result in elevated well temperature. So when we first attempted to extract naproxen from meter tips using a 20-minute pre-soak followed by one hour of sonication and methanol, which was the optimal uh, extraction solvent investigated, uh, we observed a decrease in recovery with increasing blood hematocrit as, new, as noted here by the blue bars. Again, the theory being that with increasing urethrocyte levels, analyte is effectively trapped in the pores of the substrate. In contrast, when we performed the experiment using impact-assisted extraction at 1750 RPM for 10 minutes in methanol, um, as illustrated here for the bars in green, we see not only an unbiased recovery as a function of blood hematocrit level, but we see a consistently high recovery. Now, although both approaches are direct extraction techniques, we've increased our sample preparation throughput eightfold by using impact-assisted extraction uh, rather than sonication. The next application we wanted to look at was a panel of 16 anti-epileptic drugs. Uh, as these represent a series of model compounds of disparate log P with a multitude of binding interactions. And so this really allows us to gauge the universality of the impact-assisted extraction technique for small molecule applications. So here's the list of AEDs and their respective calculated log Ps, ranging from the most polar uh, zonisamide with a log P of 0.11 to desmethylclobazum with a log P of 3.42. Now, to combine all these analytes into a single assay was a challenge, not only chromatographically due to the broad polarity range, but also mass spectrometrically due to the requirement for both negative and positive electrospray ionization modes. So we use a SIAC 6500 plus in scheduled MRM mode to optimize our duty cycle uh, with 30 second windows for each analyte or group of analytes whose retentions overlap within that window and 150 milliseconds of scan time. We use dynamic polarity cycling from uh, plus 5.5 kV to minus uh, 4.5 kV to optimize ionization efficiency for each analyte, and the polarity cycling on the 6500s on the order of 10 milliseconds. And with the peak profile uh, that I've demonstrated here in this chromatogram, we're able to achieve about 15 data points across each peak. Uh, and despite the large polarity range of AEDs, we did obtain excellent retention for the most polar analyte whilst keeping runtime to a reasonable six minutes uh, by using a Synergy Polar RP column. With the sensitivity gains of the 6500 plus that I previously highlighted, analyte response at the LOQ from only 10 microliters of sampled blood uh, was readily achieved. Average recovery of the 16 anti-epileptic drugs was better than 90% when performing impact-assisted extraction for 10 minutes at 1750 strokes per minute in 80% methanol, which was preceded by a brief aqueous pre-soak. Sometimes that helps. As far as we're aware, this is the largest panel of analytes that's yet to be co-extracted uh, from the METER substrate and does speak to the universality, or the potential universality of the impact-assisted extraction approach. In terms of the hematocrit effect, we see in this compilation that precision and accuracy data for low and high QC samples at hematocrit levels of 30 and 66% met all acceptance criteria uh, when back calculated against a curve at the median hematocrit of 40%. So not only have we achieved high recovery for all 16 analytes using impact-assisted extraction, we've also eliminated any potential hematocrit bias on recovery. Between run precision and accuracy from three batches with six QCs per batch met all acceptance criteria, with CVs ranging from 5.1 to 11.4% at the LOQ. Well, given the surge in biotherapeutic development, we next looked at the applicability of impact assisted extraction coupled to a bottom up quantitation approach for the monoclonal antibody rituximab. Now, while rituximab consists of both a light and a heavy chain, for the purpose of our evaluations, we only considered the triptych surrogate peptide from the variable region of the fab fragment for the heavy chain. So here we have the heavy chain sequence with red indicating the variable region, 
green, the surrogate peptide resulting from cleavage with trypsin, and the underlying portion coinciding to the complementary determining region. So the sample preparation looks like this. We perform impact-assisted extraction in 200 microliters of 20% acetonitrile in buffer, uh, ambic, and then leave the metre tip in situ for reduction, alkylation, and subsequent triptic digestion, after which we quench the reaction, centrifuge the supernatant, and dilute fourfold prior to injection. And what we observe is a complete lack of hematocrit bias on recovery, and once again, near quantitative recovery uh, was achieved. Recovery was linear across the concentration range with regression analysis characterized with a correlation coefficient of 0.9984, and the between-run precision and accuracy data met all acceptance criteria. In terms of microsample stability, 371 days was noted with both low and high QC stability samples demonstrating acceptable accuracy when determined against a fresh curve in QCs. And we define a fresh curve in QCs as those samples which have dried for 24 hours. Now, while impact-assisted extraction has proven successful in our lab for about 99% of the analytes we've been tasked with developing assays for, there has been one instance where factors other than hematocrit bias and age-related extractability might be at play for, fa for failed assay performance. And so I thought I would present this rather challenging study as an exemplary case to illustrate the sorts of experiments one might conduct and measures one might implement to arrive at a workable solution. So as presented in this slide, several hurdles were encountered in developing this Mitravams assay, including low recovery by vortex mixing and ultrasonication, and a loss in response of 25% for microsamples that had aged nine days and 48% for those aged 34 days. So the first hypothesis was, is this an age-related extractability issue um, due to low recovery? So we first established whole blood stability and worked out an extraction methodology which furnished 80% recovery independent of hematocrit and without matrix effect on samples which had been dried 24 hours in the presence of desiccant. After our 28 days of storage, however, we did observe uh, over 20% loss in analyte response. So we took those samples and attempted to re-optimize our extraction but could not improve recovery. So the next stage was to consider potential degradation. The analyte turned out to be stable for five hours in hemolyzed blood, so it was unlikely that degradation was enzymatically driven due to intracellular release upon uh, microsample drying. So we next considered the effects of temperature, as that's a pretty good indicator that uh, the process of, of response loss is degradation rather than just an irreversible binding uh, uh, resulting in an extractability issue from the substrate. And so when we examined stability versus storage temperature in the presence of desiccant at both our low and high QC levels, it became evident that we could, in fact, confer stability at reduced temperature, which really reinforced the notion that the analyte was degrading on the substrate. The next question we asked ourselves was, is this response loss substrate specific? So we did an accelerated aging test using 50 degrees C, 30% relative humidity for 24 hours, which emulated our high QC response loss after 28 days in the presence of desiccant uh, for Mitra blood microsamples. And we also fortified our analyte in solvent, plasma, and whole blood and sampled with not only the Mitra, but three different cellulose-based substrates that are commonly used for DDS. And as we can see in this table, the analyte response is stable on cellulose substrate under conditions of accelerated aging, but it's lost on the metre, with the losses decreasing with the amount of shielding provided by the matrix. So these data suggest that the degradation is, in fact, substrate specific. Based on the structure of the molecule, uh, a major degradation pathway might include oxidative deamination, and so the next stage was to consider pretreatment of the Mitra substrate with ascorbic acid as antioxidant and to determine if there was any impact on sampling volume accuracy or precision 
as a result of that pretreatment, pretreatment and whether the wicking performance by capillary action would be deleteriously impacted. So we performed a gravimetric assessment and found that although we lost about 13% of the sampling volume when Mitra were pretreated with one molar ascorbic acid, the precision of sampling was excellent with a CV of 2.6% based on 12 replicate measurements, and the actual mean sample volume of 9.78 microliters was close enough to the nominal value of 10 microliters. Uh, we did not observe any change in the wicking performance between untreated and treated tips. And I will make mention that pretreated tips were prepared by sampling aqueous ascorbic acid uh, and then drying those tips at 50 degrees C for, for two hours and then cooling to room temperature in the presence of desiccant uh, prior to blood sampling. So by pretreating the Mitra substrate with ascorbic acid, we were able to confer up to 17 days of stability. However, the decision was made to proceed with the reduced temperature approach uh, and this was mainly due to the timing of the study initiation and the need to establish a shelf life uh, for pretreated mitra. So from this case study, we can conclude that even though impact-assisted extraction increased our recovery from 27 to 80%, reduced recovery for age samples might not always be an extractability issue, and that subjecting samples to elevated temperature in a type of forced degradation study can reveal potential stability issues for which either reduced temperature or substrate pretreatment might be a solution. Given the analyte stability on cellulose substrate would also suggest the hemopen is the ideal microsampling approach for this analyte, However, uh, it had not received FDA clearance at the time of this investigation. Okay, so now let's move on to integrated device technology and examine how these devices further facilitate patient-centric sampling. And for this, I'll be specifically discussing our experiences with the Tasso on-demand product. Now, when your sampling device contains both the Lancet and the sample collection substrate, a number of advantages result, including the elimination of sampling error that can occur with finger stick. And we've seen both undersampling and oversampling on Mitra study samples, as I've illustrated here in the top two figures. With the design of the Tasso, the substrate in the collection reservoir is sampled to completeness without oversampling. And because there are four substrates in the fluidic path, we also acquire replicate samples per collection event. So those are really primary advantages. As well, based on subject feedback, myself included, I've tested this device on myself in many instances, uh, sampling from the upper arm results in a pain-free experience. Now, despite the device's simplicity of operation and the quality of the sample, there are still a few drawbacks, including the cost and the inability to clear the initial blood drop, which will contain interstitial fluid, right? So. Whether the latter is really a problem depends how your drug distributes and the sampling volume of the substrate. Obviously, the greater the collected volume, the less contribution there will be from interstitial fluid. In a worst case scenario, the first substrate can be discarded and you'd still be left with triplicate samples per collection event. To investigate the attributes of the TASO on-demand device, a pilot study was designed using naproxen, our favorite probe, uh, administered as a single oral dose to four subjects that were fasted for eight hours and whose blood hematocrit was measured. We collected blood from 0.25 hours up to eight hours from the upper arm onto four 10 microliter metre tips that were uh, arranged serially in the TASO sample pod. In addition, metre VAM samples were collected at one, two, and four hours from both finger stick and from venous blood in a vacutainer prior to centrifugation for plasma harvesting. So in this manner, we're able to determine whether the anticoagulant influences recovery from the metre substrate, and therefore if it impacts reported concentration. So in this study design, we're able to conduct a comparison of blood sampling sources and determine the agreement between the proxim concentrations measured in plasma and those predicted by calculation from dried blood concentrations factoring in the hematocrit level. As well, following in-clinic sampling, subjects were also provided with TASO devices for at-home collection, administering the identical naproxen dosage after a seven-day washout period, and therefore we can answer the question, could patients collect quality samples at home comparable to those collected in clinic? In other words, can they adhere to the collection timetable and successfully operate the device?
Results of mean concentration, mean blood concentrations for naproxen from each of the upper arm, finger stick, and venipuncture uh, demonstrated no significant bias, which means we have equivalent exposure between capillary and venous blood. Further, the comparability of results between the Mitravam sampling of vacutainer blood and finger stick blood uh, confirms similar extractability uh, with and without anticoagulant. In other words, the anticoagulant is having no impact on our reported concentrations. Now, since blood hematocrit was measured for each subject, predicted plasma concentrations were calculated from blood samples collected with the TASO device using the equation described in this slide. Uh, and as outlined in these figures, overlaid PK profiles of predicted plasma concentrations with measured plasma uh, concentrations are in excellent agreement for each subject, despite fewer venipuncture time points being collected uh, due to subject resistance against the invasive nature of sampling. Uh, four time points was, was sufficient. Um, the mean C-max derived from all four subjects was 75.3 micrograms per mil based on predicted plasma concentration and 78.5 micrograms per mil determined from measured plasma. So the a quite a good agreement, and the same holds true for the AUCs as well. So in this pilot study, although we've not nearly enough samples to conduct a meaningful statistical analysis, that will come when we consider clinical validation. This at least gives us enough confidence in the microsampling approach to derive PK profiles that, when corrected for hematocrit level, are in good agreement with measured plasma. So the device works for this application. In terms of the at-home sampling exercise with the TASO, PK profiles were similar to those obtained in clinic and furnished comparable average CMAX and AUC values of 74.5 and 405 hours per microgram per mil. So the device was simple enough to use. We could get quality samples, and from those we could derive PK profiles similar to those in clinic. Since our initial investigation with the TASO device, uh, which supported Mitra uh, substrate, <clears throat> there have been some engineering considerations that have resulted in modifications to the geometrical configuration of the substrate, uh, such that it's now cylindrical in nature. We've actually evaluated this second generation of substrate and can confirm that sampling volume remains unbiased by blood hematocrit, uh, as established gravimetrically and reported in the table in this slide. We also chose three of our AED probes to cover a range of log P and were able to establish recoveries from the cylindrical substrate similar to those derived from 20 microliter mitra uh, when using identical conditions for impact assisted extraction. And I should have mentioned in the previous slide <clears throat> that the substrate volume is on the order of 17.4 uh, microliters. To conclude the presentation, I'd like to just briefly highlight those critical aspects of method development and both clinical and bioanalytical validations, and for the clinical validation, describe a case study and the sorts of statistical analyses one needs to consider in order to establish concordance between a dried blood and plasma assay. And we sort of hinted at that with the TASO study, but again, we did not have enough data to perform a meaningful statistical analysis. Now, during the stage of project definition, all logistics which might impact assay performance and sample analysis are incorporated into the method development strategy. For example, considerations might include the Mitravam's blood volume required for LOQ detection, number of replicate samples required, and the geographical location of collection with associated impact of temperature and humidity on microsample stability uh, during transport and storage. Another critical consideration involves predefining the hematocrit range over which a method is expected to perform, and it's best indicated by the study population. Ideally, the hematocrit range should encompass at least 95% of the target population and the actual patient hematocrit confirmed to be within the final validated range, although honestly this is less of an issue when using impact-assisted extraction since we've uh, successfully overcome the hematocrit-induced recovery bias. In terms of method stressing, while well, the vast majority of analytical performance requirements recommended in the FDA and EMA guidelines also apply to dry blood assays, 
There are evaluations unique to Mitra VAMs that are required to ensure potential issues are resolved during the early stages of method development <clears throat> with some determination specific to the impact assisted extraction workflow. First and foremost, since internal standard fails to compensate for variability in our recovery, extraction yields should be independent of analyte concentration, blood hematocrit, and microsample age. As we've seen, poor recovery has been correlated by the Merck lab with a higher probability for age-related extractability bias, and so yields are ideally optimized to greater than 80%. In addition, <coughs> pardon me, we've found that rehydrating the tip prior to impact-assisted extraction and modification of extraction solvent pH has been demonstrated to improve recovery in some instances. As well, microsamples are subjected to accelerated testing at 50 degrees C for 72 hours to approximate aging. Should analyte instability or conversion of metabolite to parent drug, for example, a glucuronide deconjugation, be observed, then reduced temperature storage and or pretreatment of the Mitra substrate with stabilizer are evaluated and or cellulose substrates are considered. And finally, Although the hematocrit bias on recovery is eliminated by impact-assisted extraction, it is essential to evaluate matrix effect at different hematocrit levels, as this can vary. Now, the primary purpose of the clinical validation is to establish the correlation of drug concentration between peripheral blood collected by dried blood microsampling and plasma derived from venous blood. However, since peripheral blood sourced from a finger stick actually is a mixture of venous blood, arterial blood, and interstitial fluids, the clinical validation also aims to identify any potential drug concentration bias from that of venous blood. As well, given the impracticality of preparing calibrants and QCs and non-anticoagulated blood, it's imperative to ensure that analyte recovery and microsample stability are unaffected by the anticoagulant. That is, calibers and QCs containing anticoagulant must reflect non-anticoagulated samples. And we've seen that this can be conducted in vivo by collecting peripheral blood from a finger stick and anticoagulated venous blood sampled from a vacutainer prior to plasma generation. <clears throat> and so a clinical validation does include this necessary experiment. So it's important to define our clinical validation with the aim of having a sufficient number of paired samples uh, to derive statistically meaningful data from which formula can be derived to convert blood concentration into plasma concentration. And so we perform regression analysis to establish correlation, and then we run a Bland-Altman analysis to establish the bias and limits of agreement between dried blood and plasma measurements. Let's have a look at a case study to illustrate this statistical approach. <clears throat> Now, in this case study, a clinical protocol for drug A was developed to include a microsampling component in health, healthy volunteers for future applications involving at-home blood collection. And blood samples uh, from a finger stick were collected using Mitra VAMs uh, with plasma harvested from venous blood. A maximum sampling time differential of five minutes was allowed between venipuncture and finger stick uh, with a total of 187 paired samples for the establish, establishment of blood plasma concordance. So <clears throat> by examining 11 time points per subject, we ensure the entirety of the concentration range is covered. So this is the linear regression here for drug A, plotting actual measured plasma concentrations against those predicted from Mitravam's finger stick, corrected with subject hematocrit. Now the strength of the correlation within the data pairs is measured by the Pearson correlation coefficient, and here was 0.94. The line of agreement or unity line is where the results of the two measurements agree, that is y equals x, and under those conditions we have a slope of 1 and an intercept of 0. The degree to which the data pairs agree with the unity line is measured with the concordance correlation coefficient, and here was 0 0.92. Additionally, the regression slope of 1.008 is an excellent agreement with the unity line. It's important to note for this data that the correlation here is performed on, on transformed uh, data. So that is, we're computing the predicted plasma concentrations from Mitra VAMs dried blood microsamples taking into account patient hematocrit. If we did not transform the data and just plotted blood versus plasma concentrations, 
Then we could derive the blood plasma ratio from the slope of the curve for the subject population covering the entirety of the exposure range, which is much more representative than an in vitro determination. Following regression analysis, the Bland Altman difference plot is made to assess the agreement between both methods and establish the bias. So in a Bland Altman plot, the difference of the two paired measurements is plotted against the mean of the two measurements, and it's recommended that 95% of the data points should lie within plus or minus 1.96 times the standard deviation of the mean difference. So we use the standard deviation to define the limits of agreement between our measured concentrations. So from the data presented here, a few things to note. First, we determine a mean bias of only minus 1.4%. So on average, our calculated drug concentrations derived from mitravams when corrected for hematocrit are extremely accurate when compared to our reference plasma concentrations. And we know this because the 95% confidence interval uh, which are the red lines <clears throat> of the mean difference has a lower bound of minus 4.7% and an upper bound of 1.9%. And therefore, our line of equality, that is when both calculated and measured concentrations are identical, falls within our 95% confidence interval. If this line of equality were not within our 95% confidence interval, then this would indicate a significant syst uh, systematic difference wherein the VAMS method consistently would under or, or overestimate concentration. Now, the limits of agreement, which are the green lines, yeah, the limits of agreement, which are the green lines uh, between measurements derived from the standard deviation of the mean difference, indicate that 95% of our data points fall within this span. Now, <clears throat> one thing to be cognizant of is that with a the Bland-Altman plot, it only allows us to evaluate a bias between mean differences and to estimate an agreement interval within which 95% of the differences in our VAMS method fall compared to the plasma method. It does not say whether those limits are acceptable or not. So acceptable limits really need to be defined a priori based on clinical necessity. In fact, during a clinical validation, it can be investigated for each measured pair of samples whether the clinical decision by the healthcare provider would differ based on the Mitra-VAMS concentration when compared to that in plasma. Following Bland-Altman analysis, we then computed the Pearson correlation for the C-max and AUC, demonstrating excellent agreement, and then used the bioequivalence rule for, divine, for defining comparability, uh, where the geometric mean ratio of the two measurements with 90% confidence interval should fall within the equivalence range of 0 0.8 to 1.25. And for each of these PK parameters, uh, this is certainly the case. In terms of the bioanalytical validation, uh, many of the points on this slide were previously discussed in our method development slide. So here I'll just highlight that one needs to demonstrate the duration for which wet blood calibrants and QCs can be sampled, as well as the stability in the primary extraction plate when stored at four degrees should reallocating be necessary for repeat analysis. And unless for ISR, this is a much more preferable mechanism rather than using a second study sample, uh, particularly a sourced from a finger stick. We'll also determine long-term stability of the mitra microsamples under a range of conditions that cover all possible scenarios uh, involved with storage and shipping, and these include temperature, relative humidity, uh, the presence and absence of desiccants, et cetera. Finally, we'll, exam dilute, we'll also examine dilution integrity using the primary extract from a uh, blank matrix containing internal standard. Since there's very little long-term stability data reported in the literature for Mitra microsamples, I've compiled results in this table from studies conducted at Alta Sciences for four analytes with differing functional groups and polarities and, and extractions. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, all are proprietary, and so I'm unable to reveal their structures. 
Um, but all assays did use the impact assisted extraction workflow, albeit with different extraction solvents. And as we can observe in this table, stabilities are approaching two years for compounds A and B, and a year for compounds C and D when stored at room temperature and desiccant. In terms of ISR, all acceptance criteria has been met. That is, of the reassayed microsamples, better than 89% of those are within 20% of the initial determination. And so this ISR data tells us several things. First, that the blood volume wicked from individual Mitra tips in replicate sampling is accurate and precise when correctly executed, and that impact-assisted extraction has eliminated any potential extractability bias between microsamples of differing age. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues at Alta Sciences, without whom this data would not have been uh, possible. Uh, from both the R&D team and the validation group. And I'd be more than happy to address any questions you might have. Great, thank you so much for that presentation, Jeff. I hope our audience found it of great interest and value. If you do have any questions for Jeff, then please do continue to submit them using the Q&A tool in the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, we've received a number of questions so far, so we can address some of these now. Um, firstly, the use of eye mobility for quantitation is interesting. Have you actually validated methods with this approach? Any insight, Jeff? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, we actually have, and just recently, in fact, did a webinar back in May, I think it was, with SciEx, which looked at uh, differential mobility spectrometry using the Selexion device coupled to a, a 6500+. Plus. And that was for the development and validation of three different biomarkers in urine. Um, and these really represented a formidable challenge uh, as we found that without the differential mobility spectrometry giving us that additional level of orthogonal separation uh, in the gas phase, um, we weren't able to reach the levels of sensitivity that were required. Um, with one particular assay, we were actually able to get down to about 200 femtograms per mil, um, which was impossible, as I say, without, without the DMS. And in another assay, we were able to discriminate against an endogenous interference that would otherwise have resulted in an overestimation of, of biomarker concentration by quite a large amount. So uh, I think if you go to the SciEx website, you should, you should be able to find that webinar. I think it was around the May timeframe that that was done. Okay, great. Good, good resource there as well. Um, next question. You've mentioned um, you have elevated temperature in the well plates during impact assisted extraction. Is this also responsible for the high recovery or is it strictly the impact? And what if you have a thermally liable compound? Right. So <clears throat> actually, I think I saw a few questions in the, in the question Q&A uh, tab here that indicated uh, people are interested in this, this thermally labile compound solution. So to answer the first part of the question, what, what we've observed um, when we were setting up uh, early on the investigation into this technique is that if we remove the bead um, and just extract in solvent at a temperature equivalent to that when the bead is present, which is about 45 degrees Celsius after 10 minutes at 1750 strokes per minute, we see similar recoveries up to a hematocrit level of about 45%. And that seems to be the crossover point where the impact then becomes essential uh, to ensure consistent extraction yields independent of the hematocrit level. So up to 45%, um, you know, the increase in temperature uh, seems to allow hematocrit independent recovery beyond which the impact is essential. Now, for thermally labile compounds, we, for our genome grinder, we use the Spex cryo adapter. 
which fits underneath the 96 well plate. And what we do is we pre-chill the cryo adapter in a dry ice bath, and then we put the 96 well plate onto that, and the entire assembly goes into the Geno grinder. And what we find after 10 minutes of impact assisted extraction, again at 1750 strokes per minute, we're able to moderate the well temperature to about 25 degrees Celsius. Again, if we don't use the cryo adapter, the well plate temperatures uh, are about 45 degrees. And obviously that can be some problems, can, can cause some problems for, for labile compounds. Great, hopefully that answered a few questions there. Um, next question, um, the data and case studies you showed looked extremely promising. So they're wondering what sort of remaining hurdles do you see for a more mainstream adoption of microsampling? Oh, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, I think it's really a matter of overcoming the fear of change. You know, that is, we, we tend to trust our old methods over new methods. We always tend to gravitate towards what's familiar. Um, so I think what it's going to take is, is simply more case studies that sort of exemplify the quality of data that a blood microsample can deliver, right? Um, but you need to have that supportive analytical methodology on the back end that's capable of delivering accurate results. Um, I think the dreaded hematocrit effect from traditional DBS has stuck in people's minds, so it's given microsampling a less than an ideal reputation. Um, but as I demonstrated in this presentation, you know, technology has marched on and those limitations have, have really fallen by the wayside. Um, in the vast majority of modern sampling techniques. You know, it, in fact, we're almost at the point of device overload, I would say. I mean, I just touched on, on those devices that are most supported at Alta Sciences based on, based on our customer requests, but there's many more devices out there, and I think that that can lead to some confusion regarding which approach, which microsampling approach best fit uh, a given clinical prog program. Um, I guess adoption might also be throttled somewhat by the need to bridge from plasma to capillary blood for, you know, honestly, which the regulatory guidance is not particularly well defined. Um, and then you throw in all the added logistics associated with implementation. Uh, you know, it can be quite daunting at the outset. You, you have the training on the devices to consider to ensure you are acquiring a quality sample. Uh, the logistics of labeling and shipping to a central lab. So uh, I guess there's a lot to consider. Um, and then you have the additional study costs associated with the with the extra bioanalytical work, I suppose. Um, I mean, said all this, I, I can't think of a better case for remote sampling than than you know during the pandemic that we're we're currently in, and and, and perhaps current situation the world finds itself in will, will actually further propel blood microsampling and and you know allow us to find solutions to some of these some of these limitations. Great, thank you Jeff. Great, great ending there. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. Um, question is if one wants to incorporate microsampling into their clinical program, how many paired samples does one need to establish a suitable correlation? Well, that's a really rather difficult question. That's probably best answered <laughs> by one of our PK or biostat scientists. Um, what I can tell you is that the CLSI guideline, the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute for, for Therapeutic Drug Monitoring, they state at least 40 patient samples, paired samples, um, should be analyzed in your clinical validation. And that those samples should ideally cover the entirety of the exposure range, right? So you could have 40 different patients, I guess, collected at a single time point, you know, trough or peak, or you could take paired samples from at least two to three, or two to, you take two to three time points from a smaller cohort. Um, and if that's done, the CLSI uh, recommends that at least 25 different patients uh, to account for any variation in matrix effect. From the FDA standpoint, the most recent guidance document indicates uh, at least 20 samples uh, are recommended, again, encompassing the, the entirety of the exposure range. If 
you're in the fortunate situation of already having some data for the variability between sample pairs, obviously that's going to help estimate the necessary sample size, um, you know, to help you better define the relationship between your methods. And, you know, that might very well result in having to increase your sample size beyond the recommendations of, of the FDA. Actually, just last week there was a presentation by Dr. Carol Gleason from BF, BMS at the Lana Lakes Conference discussing concordance, and she claimed that in her experience, usually 30 to 40 paired samples is sufficient um, for these sorts of, of comparisons. Um, if you don't have any data a priori between sample pairs, uh, that gives you an idea of variability upon which to base your sample size, then worst case scenario, you can use the CV of the two validated methods, the plasma and the mitra VAMs. Um, but again, really the PK and the biostats people, they're the ones that have all the statistical software, you know, such as nQuery, and, and they're better able to estimate a sample size needed to provide that confidence, um, you know, that the 90% confidence interval for the ratio of those geometric means, which I illustrated in one of my slides, that does in fact fall within the equivalence interval of 0.8 to 1.25. So really, um, the PK and biostat people they have all the necessary software to, to give a uh, to give a more unequivocal answer. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Jeff, for answering those questions today. Um, we will address all of those other questions offline. Um, I'd like to once again thank our wonderful presenter as well as you, our listeners, for your time and questions. Um, don't forget to visit us at www.bioanalysis-zone.com for more webinars. And thank you again for attending, and goodbye for now.